at noon for the Lunchtime Discovery Series, brought to you by the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality, who coordinate and organize the program and a broadcast service of us here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, hosted by me, broadcasted by the folks in our digital media department here at the museum, working together to bring you every week, or almost every week, uh, a great program talking about science, nature, art, environment, and education, and beyond. So uh, always great to be with you for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Now, make sure that you are paying attention to the Lunchtime Discovery Series emails. If you're not getting the emails, you should sign up. You can do that at the Environmental Education Office's website. That's eenorthcarolina.org. There you can sign up. You can see upcoming programs. You can stay in the loop with what's happening with this program because really this program has been going on for a long time and it's great. Like we meet really cool and interesting people who are doing interesting things out there all across the state of North Carolina. And really you want to be here. Now here at the museum's YouTube channel, where I'm guessing you're probably taking in today's program, you can also find an archive of past programs on the Lunchtime Discovery Series playlist. So make sure you give that a scroll too at some point and uh, check out some of the past programs, past cool and interesting people who've talked about really cool and interesting things. Today's program, I think is going to be no different. We've got somebody who seems like a pretty cool and interesting person. He's an associate professor of biology at St. Andrews University, which is a branch of Weber International University, and is going to talk to us a little bit about some of North Carolina's biodiversity. Everybody, put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Dr. Tracy Feldman. Hi, Tracy. Hey, Chris. How are you? All right. I'm so doing pretty good. I want to thank everyone for um, for coming and for listening to this and and thanks chris for hosting is it okay if i should i share at this point or yeah let's launch into it i'm excited to uh see and hear your presentation today so today i wanted to start with a quote by eo wilson a lifetime can be spent in a Magellanic voyage around the trunk of a single tree. And for me, this quote brings up two points. The first one is that we still don't understand everything about our world yet, in, including some of the things in some things in our own backyards. And the other point that I want to bring up about this is that it in some ways we can make amazing discoveries when we look closely at the world around us and look at the little things so let's see for some reason it's advancing um hmm. so i want to talk about overlooked biodiversity why we should catalog biodiversity and why we should do it here in north carolina I want to talk about small and squishy critters called leaf miners, and I'll explain more about those later. And then I'll talk about some discoveries related to leaf mining insects, including new locations. So when I've, I've found them in new places where we hadn't seen them before, or new host ranges. So new food plants for these guys that we didn't know about before. And then entirely new species. And when we talk about new species, I want to also talk about how we name the new species, because th there's a process involved and I wasn't altogether clear on the process before I started to, to do this work. And so I want to clarify it for everyone as well. All right, and then also I want to give you guys some tips on how to look for leaf mining insects yourselves so that you also can make discoveries. And so I want to start with biodiversity. And this is, uh, these are pictures of organisms in terrestrial ecosystems. And it, it doesn't cover very much of, of terrestrial biodiversity, but at least gives you some representation of it. Most biodiversity is actually on land. It is terrestrial biodiversity. 
Um, and so I wanted to ask folks, and I really want to know what you think. So you can type your answers in the chat and in, in YouTube and, and uh, Chris. Why does it matter if we know what other species are around us? So I'll give you a little time to do that. But while you do that, I want to also, I want to weigh in with, with one reason. One of the main reasons for me is that, the, that we're facing a mass extinction right now. Um, any, any responses yet, or should I? Let's see, nothing just yet has popped into the chat, but I'm sure That's knowing fine. this audience, they've got, uh, they're, they're yeah. writing novels about it. No, sure. And, and, and other, my next, the questions I ask next will also um, relate. So in May 2019, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, it's a mouthful, they put out a report suggesting that a million species, at least a million species are threatened with extinction right now. And those are just the ones we know about. The, those are just the ones that we, we know their status. And right now, the biodiversity crisis is quite acute. Uh, there are places called biodiversity hotspots in the world. These are places with high concentrations of species, of large numbers of species, but also large numbers of species found nowhere else. That's called, those are called endemics. And these places, all of these biodiversity hotspots are under threat right now. There is only 5% to 30% of any of these hotspots left due to human encroachment. So, my next question that I also would love people to, to weigh in on, and it relates to the same thing, is that if we preserve a habitat for an organism, does that, will that necessarily preserve the species in them? Do we have to worry about what species are there? In other words, do we need to catalog what's there if we just preserve the habitat for that organism or for those organisms? And so I, I do want to know your thoughts on this. If, if you know, and if if it happens that people have thoughts later, that's fine. I don't mind being interrupted. So I may, we'll see. Are, are you got something or? or? Yes, uh, we've got some responses rolling in. Uh, Pam awesome. writes that it's important so we know how to protect nature, which we depend upon. Nikki added, uh, "We protect what we love. We love what we know." Stephen, who I think is watching from Chimney Rock, writes, uh, knowledge of diversity numbers can help us value areas for conservation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mary writes, if you don't know what's out there, you won't notice when it's gone. Uh, so as bioindicators in a way. Mm -hmm. Great. That, that last response actually leads in very well to what I'm, what I'm getting at here is that are apparently intact ecosystems really intact? How do we know if we don't know what's in them? We might be able to preserve a habitat and this habitat looks quite good, but at the same time, is it really good? In other words, so um, just what, what, what Chris relayed before, how will we know if species are missing or declining if we don't know what's there? Or if one species is becoming much more common than it normally is due to changes in the system, we might not notice that unless we are keeping track of what's there. The other more subtle issue is that with climate change, we expect people, the, the organisms are, are going to either come out earlier or later. And if that timing of events in an organism's life, their phenology changes, we might not know if we're not keeping track of what's there. All right, cool. Are there any more responses I'll, I'll, um, that you want to relay? And I'll, otherwise, I'll, I'll continue. Yeah, let me read off a few of these because there's some good ones Great. here. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Marty from the Environmental Education Office wrote that beyond just the pure ethics, it's understanding the species and interactions help with ecosystem resiliency. Yeah. Uh, 
Albert writes that due to the complexity of ecosystems means we may not even know which species may be critical to ultimate ecosystem health and stability, which is important. Uh, and then Cindy wrote that interdependence of species in an ecosystem and food webs makes it important uh, to keep track. Yeah. Preserve, preserve habitats. I think I'll have to uh, add these to my slide. All right, that's cool. That's really great. Thank you very much. That, that's, those are great additions to this. And, and I, uh, yeah, absolutely. Well said. All right, so it turns out that we are living close to a biodiversity hotspot. One of the world's 36 biodiversity hotspots is on the Southeastern coastal plain. So running right down this area um, right here and and it's and and North Carolina is included in that and this is just a, a, a picture of plant family biodiversity and the number of plant families found and the bluer darker green to blue areas are the more diverse ones. So this is a biodiversity hotspot and it's true for mammals it's true for birds found nowhere else mammals found nowhere else. Um, reptiles and amphibians. It's true for many other groups, but I focus on the plants because the plants are really important and to many of the insects that are out there feed on plants. And if there are more diverse plants, because insects tend to specialize and feed on only one or a few plant species, the more plant species you have, the more, the more insects you will have as well. So, and that's what I'm focusing on. North Carolina is also under threat, that biodiversity is under threat right now because um, for the last 10, 11 years, we've been growing 1% yearly in, in terms of our population and that will result in more land conversion. So we see that only a relatively few places left of, of the intact habitats. If we look at the biodiversity of animals and plants, this is disregarding fungi and bacteria and other things, but at the same time, just, just organisms, just animals and plants, we see that most of the diversity out there is insects. And most of the diversity of insects are, are herbivorous insects, feeding on plants. So we can think about one mechanism for maintaining biodiversity involving plants. So we have one plant here, a plant species here, and there are many things that eat that plant. They may eat the leaves, so they might eat on the surface of the leaf. They might feed it below the surface of the leaf, in, inside the leaf, which I'll talk about, leaf miners or gall insects that inject plant hormones, that secrete plant hormones that build themselves a tumor to live in or sap feeders that use straw-like mouthparts to suck sap from the plant, or flower feeders, or they may eat the stems, they may eat the roots, they may eat nectar and transfer pollen in the process, that's what pollinators do. They may eat fruits or and disperse the seeds, they may eat the seeds. So we've got a whole bunch of things that could eat these plants and they may eat it all in different ways. Uh, there are other organisms that protect or eat some of these other things. So there are protective ants on sap feeders. There are predators and parasites of all these things, predators and parasites of all these things. There are predators and parasites of predators and parasites. And there's decomposers that eat them all when they die. Oh, and I forgot the mycorrhizal fungi that associate with the roots of plants. So a plant may actually support an entire community of organisms associated with it. And, and if you have a different plant species next door, it will have potentially some of the same species interacting with it, but also some different ones. And some of the ones that interact with this one won't interact with the one next door. So because of specialization. So I'm gonna focus on a tiny fraction of this. I'm gonna focus on the leaf miners. And there's one more bit of background that you need before we start, and, and that's the insect life cycle. I wanna just quickly review that. For two of the main groups that I'm gonna be talking about, moths and flies, the life cycle is fairly similar. They start with eggs, eggs here, eggs here, and they hatch into the larval stages. And there are several larval stages. So it could be um, four to six larval stages usually. And they, they have exoskeletons, skeletons on the outside. So they get bigger by shedding their old exoskeleton and, and, then, in, and then inflating their body. 
and then the new skeleton hardens, so they get bigger that way. And then they pupate, and in the pupation stage, they change from the larval stage to the adult stage. They lose some things that they don't need anymore as larvae, and they gain some things like wings that they need as adults. And during that stage, they're also vulnerable, so they're not very mobile, and that'll play a role in the life history of some of these things. The pupil stages are often hidden in one way or another. And then the adult comes from the pupa, and the adult lays eggs, so mates and lays eggs. All right, so that's a review of the insect life cycle. Um, and then I want to address what are leaf miners. So leaf miners are actually, if you imagine a room where the where the top surface of the leaf might be the ceiling, the bottom surface of the leaf is the floor, and the leaf miners eat their way through the room, so the tissue in between. And so the second point about leaf miners is it's not they're not one taxonomic group. They are they, so some beetles are leaf miners, some flies are leaf miners as larvae. This is during their larval stage, and they might also pupate in the mine, but their larval stage is what does the feeding on these in, inside the leaf. Um, some moths are leaf miners as larvae, and some wasps called sawflies are, are leaf miners as larvae. So it's a lifestyle, it's not a taxonomic group. Here on to illustrate that on one single leaf, you have two mines, one made by a fly to the left and one made by a moth to the right. And the adults are pictured on the sides. And notice how branched these mines are. One study, recent study came out showing that the branched nature of the mines makes it harder for predators to locate them in the mines. So it's a way of helping to avoid them to avoid predators. So here it is in its natural habitat. And what you notice is that they're different from the surface feeders that might chew holes and damage the surface on one or both sides of the leaf. These leaf miners, these the second and third arrows, are not really damaging the surface very much, either surface, either the upper or lower surface very much. And they're also relatively specialized and they're often very small. So these, the fact that they're living in tight spaces means that they can only get so big unless they get out of the mines and feed a little bit outside the plant. And even then they don't tend to get that big. So these are called microleps when they're, when they're moths, they're called microleps, microlepidoptera, because they're really small. So let's say around two to four millimeters long. They're very specialized. So this is a common plant, Ulmus alata. It happens to have a snail on it, um, it's, or winged elm. And it has nine species of miners that are relatively specialized on this. Um, so there's a fly, Agromyza aristata. They also feed on hackberry. So they're not completely specialized, but they're pretty specialized. And then Stigmella apicele bella, which is also, which is a moth that's, that's specialized. The Camararia ulmella, which is a moth that's also specialized to elms and maybe oak, but it could be that the one on oak is actually, um, is actually different. Is actually a different species. It's hard to tell you right now. Um, the um, is a, a beetle species that's probably specialized to elm. There are two moths in the genus Phylonorycter. They are tent miners. They bunch up the leaf at the top and have a, a thin membrane of the, a bottom leaf surface at the bottom, like a tent. And so there are two species of those that are on elms. There's another moth, Ectoidemia, that's on, on elm. There's another one in the genus Buculatrix that's a, uh, that, that is um, on, specialized on elms. This one has a tiny little mine, starts here, goes to here, then it gets out and feeds a little bit outside the plant and then pupates in these ridged pupa, or these ridged cocoons that are really interesting. Um, this one turned out to be a new species. This is also probably a new species that mines the stem. So this is nine species that are mostly specialized on elms. Um, they're also pretty overlooked. They're under the radar. That's when, the, hence the title of the talk. This is a website that focuses on, on natural history and it's deal, discussing a plant called coralberry. And not once do they mention the leaf miner that's on that plant because they probably didn't notice it. And the same leaf miner was on a different site, same plant. and again, they don't mention it. So these are under people's radar. People don't notice them. When I started to notice them, I, I wanted to use one for a class project 
and I tried to identify it and nobody could help me identify it. And so I talked with a friend who knew somebody in Massachusetts, Charlie Eisman, who was working on a book on of the leaf miners in North America. And I sent him a picture and he said, it's probably a new species. And my jaw hit the floor. And then I started looking for all of the leaf miners I could possibly find. And this, you can see the larva here. And I still haven't solved this mystery. Ironically, this is one I still haven't solved. I still have no, we, we still don't quite know what it is. And uh, we'll see if we can ever get it. I'll explain why in a bit. So this brings up my next point, which is that I, thought in the past that I would have to go to the tropical rainforests or something to find new species or the deepest oceans. And instead I can go to the deepest road cuts or my backyard. And in fact, I've found new species in both of those situations. Um, and note that our biodiversity is under threat. I'll talk about this more later, but this roadside has been sprayed. So we'll talk about that later. So I wanna talk about a couple of discoveries and give you some examples of some of the discoveries, including range expansion, so new locations for miners, we already know what they are, and host range expansion, so new food plants for miners that are already known, and then some new species. And I wanna give you a sense of what to look for as well. The idea is to look closely look everywhere, but closely at vegetation. And if you see any unusual plants, ones you don't normally see, look for miners on it. You might, it might be an interesting species, it might be something that, that people haven't documented yet. Or look on common plants. I've found if they're really abundant. There may be lots of things that use it and some of them may be, end up being new. So look everywhere, in other words. Um, all right. so. I want to give you a sense of the big picture first before I launch into a few examples. There are about 401 leaf mining insects recorded in North, in North Carolina so far. That's a conservative estimate. I've documented about 326 of those. Um, other people are working to do it, including James Petronka in the mountains. He's working on these as well, mostly the moths in the mountains. I found about 30 species of beetles that mine about 87 species of flies that mine, three species of saw flies that mine. These are pictures of them that appear as I'm talking about them. And, and about 206 species of moths. Other people have found 75 additional species of moths that are miners. There may be other ones as well. Again, this is a conservative estimate. Uh, there are, so of the ones that are known species with new food plants recorded, there are about five beetles with new food plants recorded, about 19 flies, and at least 17 moths with new food plants recorded. There were also so species that were not previously known from North Carolina, but they are known species, include at least four fly species, but could be like 80, because I don't know how many people are actually studying these species at all in, in North Carolina. So so just finding any of them might might end up being new for the state, but some of them are not so surprising, but some of them are. Some of them are, are found only a few states away and they're not found anywhere near here. Um, and then 82 moth species I've added to the NC Biodiversity Project. And then uh, at, at least 28 species are new, um, six, including 16 flies and 12 moths probable so far. There's probably more that are new. So here's an example of a range expansion. This is probably the most dramatic example I can give you. This is Liriomyza schmidtii. And before we found it in North Carolina we, and South Carolina, it, was found, it wasn't found north of Florida. We didn't know that it was north of Florida. Um, it, it's, a, it's an exception that proves the rule in that this one is a generalist. It feeds on lots of different species of plants. And this one is feeding on Carolina jessamine, but also feeds on, on greenbrier and many other plants. So when we're thinking about host range expansion, new food plants, this one was is a new species, so of course it's any plants are going to be new, but it feeds on a bunch of different things, including Carpheferus bilitifolius, beautiful plant, and also lots of species, a few species of bidens. Uh, so those are called beggars ticks or Spanish needles. So it feeds on those too, and you can see the larva here. This little yellow thing is the larva mining through the tissue, and that's what the adult looks like. So that's a new species. And uh, another one that's kind of cool was one I found at 
Lake Crabtree and a few other places. Um, the adult was documented by Annette Braun in 1923, but she didn't know what it ate. And in 2018, I found this caterpillar in inside the tissue, so mining through the tissue of Houstonia, so bluets, and um, and also on um, a galium species of sort of wild licorice species, um, galium uniflorum. And it turned out to be this moth. Uh, so discovered almost 100, rediscovered almost 100 years after it had been documented for the first. And now we know what it eats. Uh, and so that's one of the exciting things about this work is that by looking for them in the larval stages, you get their host plant records and some of their uh, life history as well, not just the adult and documenting the adult. So what, now I wanna talk about new species and how do we get to name new species? Well, there's sort of a three-part process involved. And one of the first thing is we have to check whether it's really new and we have to convince ourselves that it's new. The second thing is we have to convince other people that it's new and we do that by describing the species. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And then the third thing is that we need to actually choose a name for it once we decide that it is new. And so to clarify this process, I interviewed briefly uh, Owen Lonsdale, a collections manager for the Canadian National Collection of Insects, Arachnids, and Nematodes. And so he's working with us on the fly, um, flies, and in this, we've published a couple papers documenting new flies in North Carolina. And he outlined three, a few challenges. The first one is the group well studied. If the group is really well studied, then that gives us a better chance at determining whether what we have is new, because we can compare it to everything that's known. So the better studied the group, the better off we are in terms of figuring out whether our thing is new. The other, the next thing challenges is the group diverse. If the group is really diverse, it's going to be really hard to compare our species to everything else that's out there. It's going to be much harder. And for instance, the group of the main group of flies that are leaf miners, there are others, there's agromyzid flies, and there are over 800 species of them in the US. And that means that anything new we find, or anything that we suspect is new, we have to compare it to all those other species. So it makes it challenging. I'm glad Owen Lonsdale is doing it and not me. Um, and so I, um, then a the third, the third issue is that we have to find characteristics that tend to vary by species in that family. So if there, we know it's in a particular genus or family, we can then figure out if there are characteristics that are consistent that vary by the, with that species that just are consistent to that species and not in other ones. And we can use external characteristics or we can use often there are sexual parts, organs, the usually male genitalia in these flies, but sometimes it's female parts, but in this case, it's males for flies. Okay, so here's an example. We can use DNA data to construct a family tree for a group of organisms, and it tells us which organisms are, clo are closely related to which other ones. Sometimes we use morphology for that too. So morphology is what they look like, the external characteristics or internal ones. So if we have a bunch of characteristics, we can build this family tree. And what you notice is this red species actually occurs in two places on the family tree. That means it's probably not one species, but two. It probably actually is two species instead of one. And so we might, then use that information to determine that we've got something new. There's another way, and that's using morphology. So here are two fly species that adults look fairly similar to each other. There's a few differences, but they're mostly pretty similar. And they're in the same genus. But if we look at their sexual parts, they look pretty different. It turns out, so this is the the penis and the phallus. And, and so you can see there's a lot of little ridges here that are not on this one over here. This ejaculatory apodeme, another sexual part, is very large here and very small here. So we can tell by using the sexual parts of these organisms, they often vary sometimes more than the external parts of the organisms because they sometimes fit like a lock and key into their mates. It prevents other species from cross mating. So I want to make another point that the 
more species there are in a group, the more detail we need to help tell species apart. So these are five species. They don't look like much, but they're five species. And you can tell them apart pretty easily, right? So there's characteristics to distinguish all of them. But let's say we discover a whole bunch more species in that genus. And now there's overlap between characteristics. So the characteristics we use to tell this one apart from other ones doesn't work anymore. We need new characteristics, so we need more traits. And maybe if we get more characteristics, we can figure out some that vary by species and we can tell some of these apart. But some of them, like this yellow through red one, we may not be able to tell those apart because there may not be characteristics that help us distinguish them. And it may be that this is just one species with a lot of variation within it. So one of the things I wanna make a point about this is that, and that Owen Lonsdale also corroborated is that natural history matters. It can give us additional data to help tell species apart, like the host plant they use, which might be different among different leaf miners that otherwise look the same. And, and seasonality when they're out. So some may only be out in the fall, some may only be out in the spring. Then the mine characteristics may also be important, whether they, which way they mine. And some miners look different on different host plants, so we have to be careful about that, but it can add more data. So we can use all of those characteristics then, once we decide that it's new, we can use all those characteristics, including the natural history, to help describe the species and convince other people that it's new. Now we have to name it. And before I do that, I want to give an example so of morphology that matters. So this is a, a species of fly that mines the tissue of wisteria, of, uh, an invasive wisteria, actually, uh, the Japanese wisteria. And it starts as a as kind of a, the, the linear mine con condenses into a blotch, and you end up with this blotch at the end of a leaf. And it's this one, Agromyzosoka. And, um, it, this is out for a very short time in the early spring, and the larvae are, and then the, um, and then it pupates in the leaf litter, and stays there for almost the entire year, and then the adults come out the next year and lay eggs. And so this is kind of a boring life because they spend most of their lives in the leaf litter pupating. So it's kind of crazy. There's another species that comes out at the same time, and starts with a line at the end of the leaf, and then that expands into a blotch. And this turned out to be an, an additional new species that we haven't finished describing yet, but that we probably will hopefully soon. So we got two species and they have different mind characteristics and that helped us tell them apart. All right, so now how do we name the species? Well, the species names occur in two parts and that's due to the binomial nomenclature left us by um, Linnaeus who founded this method. The genus name, tells us the group that it's in, the, the, the other species that are similar to it. Um, so it tells us the, the, what group that's in. And then the specific epithet is just specific to that species. We can name the species for the external characteristics that they have or for the host plant, which is potentially a little difficult because if the host plant if the plant name changes over time, then we end up with an anachronistic name. And then, and we can also name them for locations, but the locations can also change names. So that can be problematic. And then we can name them for people we want to honor as well. And we can follow Latin or sometimes Greek rules associated with that. So this one, for instance, Agromyza soca, it's in the genus Agromyza. So it's with other, so that helps place it in the context. And then Soka is, is Greek for stout. It means stout, and it's named for a very stout penis that this thing has. Yes, it's named for that. Um, all of these are named for the plants that they eat. So all of these endings tell us that they are associated with a particular plant species or, or genus. This is this one feeds on a rundinaria, which is a switch cane or, or, um, or a ba wild bamboo. And this one feeds on Chrysopsis, which is um, golden aster, um, et cetera. So these all, feed, these all are named for the plants that they eat or where they were discovered. 
Um, there are other ones that are named for places. The name ensis, the ending ensis in a specific epithet tells us that it's named for a place. So canadensis is a common one. Another one is, this one is St. Andrew's ensis. It was discovered at St. Andrew's University property. So we called it St. Andrew's ensis. Then we want, if we want to honor people, we can name them for males or females that we want to honor. This one happens to be named after me. So I'm excited about that. And um, okay, so those are that, those are some names. And so now I want to give you some examples of some new species. It turns out that wild bamboo, we found three new species on wild bamboo. These are all flies, and they all are feeding on wild bamboo. So it's kind of crazy and cool. And and there may be other species on wild bamboo. We don't know yet, but it, it'd be good to find out. Um, this is a plant that I don't see very often, so I was interested in, in looking at it, and I found a leaf miner on it, and you can see the larvae in there, and that's what the adult looks like. It turned out to be a new species. This was in Duke Forest. This was in leaf farm at Leaf Farm Park um, on Golden Aster. It's another species of fly that um, so that so there's anyway the, the, all these plant species may be common, but their leaf miners are previously unknown. And here's the puparium, the pupa. Okay. All right, so I want to move on to moths, examples of new species of moth. This one was known before I found it, but they hadn't ever reared, raised an adult. So they didn't, they'd seen the mines before and knew it was probably something new, but they never had raised the adult before. And so I found some at St. Andrews and, and, and we raised an adult from it. So these are in a group called, in a genus called Philipnistus, and they're, they are mining the upper surface of the leaf. They are mining under the surface, but just under the upper surface. It's amazing that there's enough space in a flat leaf to actually specialize in the upper or lower surface, but some of them do. And so this one is an upper surface specialist and it, and it has a long mine because it's mostly feeding on sap as it goes or sugars as it goes. And then it uh, and, and it still pupates into a very tiny moth, a few millimeters long. It curls the leaf at the end where it pupates, and then an adult comes out, hopefully, if we're lucky. These are two members of the genus Buculatrix. They both turned out to be new. They Buculatrix makes a tiny little mine and then gets out and feeds a little bit outside the plant. Um, it may have these resting cocoons, which they the larvae change into larger larvae in there so uh, on and they're so tiny that that even on these tiny finely dis dissected leaves of of dog fennel they can mine up one side of a leaf and down the other side of a tiny little branch of a leaf and then they get out feed a little bit and then pupate and make a cocoon that has these ridges on it the ridges are really it's beautiful they're beautiful cocoons and they're beautiful moths when they come out as adults both of these turned out to be new species these are tent miners again the ones that bunch up the leaf at the top and have a thin membrane at the bottom of, of, of the leaf mine um, and these pupate inside the mines which not all tent miners do but this one was on live oak and it's and the adult it turned out to be it turned out to be a new species um, this one is also a new species on a strange small tree called styrax and beautiful flowers in the early spring and then these mines appear later spring to summer and they these this one actually does exit the mine and makes leaf rolls and feeds a little bit outside the mine for a while and it gets a little bigger than some of the other miners but not that big it's still only millimeters long and this is what the adult looks like it's probably new calyptilia is one understudied groups. So this one is one where we may not actually be able to describe it for a while until that group is better studied in general. Um, this one, the Marmara, the, the first one I, I started to actually try to identify, um, it turns out that I still haven't identified it. These are really hard. The Marmaras can mine leaves, they can mine down the leaf and into the stem and down the stem. And again, who know, then it's difficult because who knows how, where it's going to come out or when, and it's really hard to actually get an adult. Um, and so we managed to get adults from at least six of these, six species of these um, that are probably new. And there are at least 10 other species that we only know from mines. And sometimes I've only ever seen them once or twice and not again. All right, so this is one I lucked out with. Um, 
that it's on Elm and I followed the mine and found an exit hole. And then I looked on the tree trunk and lucked out and found a, a few cocoons. And the cocoons are, they pupate underneath that sheet of, of silk. And then outside this, the silk, they, they kick these little balls. They make these little balls called frothy bubbles and no one knows exactly what they are or what they do. And other members of this family of, of moths do this, but the marmora are known are one genus that's known for that. And I I razor I took a razor blade and cut the cocoon with the bark on, under it off the tree and got an adult from it. The adult looks like this. So I want to leave you with a, a a few things, a few other things. I want to talk about a few mysteries, ones that are still unsolved, like the first marmora I showed you. This one is a, in the group called Gelichiidae, and we don't know what it is. It feeds as a miner at first on hexastylus, so little brown jugs, and it, then it gets out and feeds as a larva. The one I've ever found died at Lake Crabtree. It, it died uh, before it got to adulthood, so we have no idea what it is. And if anyone ever sees anything like this, please document it and maybe collect it and try to raise it if you have permission to do so. Um, and then the, the next one is, is on the coast. There's a coastal plant called Iva fructescens or Jesuit's bark. And this is a but buculatrix. Again, I, I failed to rear it last summer. I'm hoping I'll have a chance to raise it to adulthood this, this summer, but we'll see. I don't know if I'll find it. Um, this is a tiny one on, on bracken fern. It is probably a moth, but we're, we're not sure what it is other than that. Um, the one we found that was still active um, died th this summer and we so we still don't know what it is we're hoping that we can try to find it again this summer um, this is a weird one it's a fly and as they mine they roll the leaf usually leaf rollers roll a leaf using silk and then tie it up this one is not doing that and we don't know how it's doing that it doesn't appear to be associated with a pathogen it doesn't it, it seems to happen on the weirdest thing is it seems to happen on only one tree and not all the leaves of that one tree. So that means that some of the miners on that tree don't roll the leaves, but this one does. Um, they may be different species that, that do and don't. Um, and, then when, and then it rolls into this tight roll and then the miners pupate outside the mine and flies come out. It may be a known miner, but we don't know what it is. Um, so if you're, if you're gonna look for these things, you'll want to look closely. So having magnification helps. Loops are probably easier to come by than dissecting microscopes, but both are useful. Um, you can look at different times of year. You can look on different plants and different plant parts. Don't forget stems. I found some interesting things on stems. And if miners are on leaves, you can photograph both sides of the leaf. So you know if it's an upper surface or lower surface specialist or, and then backlit leaves so you can maybe even see the critter inside. Uh, you can, if you have permission to collect them, you can put them in a vial and a plastic snap cap vial is the best. You can label it with a Sharpie or put it in a bag and label that bag. Um, I have these pupation chambers for a few of them that require soil to pupate in. You put the larvae, you transfer the larvae with a paintbrush onto the soil and they can burrow down and pupate and a little bit of water, soil and sand mixed. Um, if I want to preserve leaves, I can do so in coin envelopes. And if I want to preserve um, actual adults, I can do that, or pupae, I can do that in ethanol, unless they're moths, and then it destroys their, their scales, it gets, takes the scales off their wings. So what you want to do for moths is dry them out and put them in, in a gel caps, or, or like uh, unfilled, Pill, cap, pill capsules, empty pill capsules. Then you, you can submit your photographs to iNaturalist. You can get a free uh, account on iNaturalist and all you need is a photo, a location and a date to contribute to scientific studies on these things. And some people on iNaturalist have documented species of miners that are probably new and have, and have contributed to our knowledge of, of leaf miners. Um, another free account you can get is one to bug guide. There's the, the website that's shown here is actually a node that, that is specific to leaf miner photographs. So you can post photographs of leaf mines and leaf miners there. I wanna end with a, a note about, about threats. 
So this roadside is sprayed and you can see roadsides getting sprayed every year along our highways and roadsides. And, and these are, roadsides are often diverse places for plants um, and places for diverse plants. And if you spray all the plants, the things that eat them die as well. We've lost a third of our birds in North America. And this is relevant because all these insects are food for birds. So we are killing off the biodiversity of our world and a lot of and one of the reasons that the um, that the birds are declining is because their food sources are declining. So the more we spray and get rid of stuff, the more and kill species, the more we kill other species on which they depend. And so these leaf miners, if one asks what good are they, they are food for lots of things, birds and, and other and insects as well and other things. All right, so I want to thank people who helped me with this. Um, some lots of people helped me document species. People helped me ID species of plants and the insects themselves. And then people helped me protect some of the areas on St. Andrew's campus in particular. Um, and then um, and several people helped give me access and or helped with permits to collect in various places. So thank you to all those people. And if there are any questions, I'll take them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting stuff. Uh, I can't say that I have paid much attention to the things crawling around on the inside of the leaves. Uh, whether it's outside the museum here in downtown in my own yard, park, I'm gonna have to look a lot closer. Yeah, there's there could be lots of different things for sure, for sure. Yeah, and they could be new species. How exciting! They could be. I know it's crazy. I can't. When I found one in my own backyard, I thought, "Wow, okay." I've, I've, I, I don't know. I felt like a, an accomplishment or something. I don't know. So, a question for you then, uh, from me is when you find one of these leaf miners, you're, you're clipping the stem or the branch of the leaf and then trying to rear it out. But what's your like go-to resource for trying to figure out what species you have? Is it bug guide? Is it sending photographs to experts? Normally I, I send photographs to, initially I sent photographs to experts. That's initially what I did. I, once I knew that I, once I had developed this connection with Charlie Eisman, I just posted, he asked me to post the photographs on, on Bug Guide, and so I just did. I posted a ton of things on Bug Guide. Once I started getting responses back, I started to fill in a data sheet and sort of get familiar with the species. And by now I've been doing this for eight years. So I, at this point, I, I kind of know what genus it's in anyway. Sometimes I know what species they are immediately. Sometimes I know only know what genus they're in or what family they're in. Sometimes I have no idea. And those are the ones I'm excited about because I'll, and so I'll post the photographs. I'll try to figure it out. Sometimes I'll try to figure it out on my own. Uh, I can use Charlie Eisman's book. If it's known, it's got to be in there. So I'll, I'll use this book and uh, to try to help me out sometimes and or I'll just look online to see what else is out there. If there's any anything known from this from that plant species that looks similar. Sometimes I'm wrong in my estimate about what it is. And uh, I'll find that out. But you know, and I'll post to bug guide and, and then sometimes I'll venture to guess what it is on bug guide and Sometimes I'll be wrong and I'll feel sheepish about it, but sometimes I'll be right. Um, sometimes I'll suspect that something's a new species and occasionally I'm vindicated, even when people tell me initially, no, it's probably not, but, but it ends up being new. So occasionally that's happened too. But. Oh, wow. Fascinating stuff. Well, let, uh, let me see what folks in the, in the chat are thinking about. Great. Uh, the first question that came up for you, how do you feel about creating a species name based on a celebrity? like the newly named millipede in an area swift day named for taylor swift cool <laughs> i don't see a problem with it I, I i definitely i think if we want the probably the best thing to do in terms of science is to name something in, in terms for these herb, herbivorous insects is to name it 
after the host plant that it eats, because that's kind of informative. The danger of doing that, of course, as I said before, is if the plant name changes. But then again, if there are a ton of species or a, at least a few species within a given plant species that are, are, or within a genus that feed on the same plant species, then you might as well have fun with the rest of the names. So um, that was why we ended up naming one, I argued for St. Andrewsensis as one of the species names because we already named two after Arundinaria and there was another one in the same genus on Arundinaria. So might as well name it against about name it something different. So I could have done a celebrity and maybe I should have done that, but instead I named it after the place I, where I work. So. That makes sense, makes sense to me. It also reminds me of um, species names that uh, are designations that go to like fictional characters. Uh, yeah. Like, I don't, I don't know. There's like, there's a beetle that's named after Darth Vader from Star Wars. Yeah. And, yeah. and in the paper, they described like 57 new species of these tiny beetles. And one of them got the fun name. Yeah. 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 And I think that's often true. And there, there are some interesting and fun little jokes that people sort of plant in, in various names. So it's kind of cool, but um, yeah. All right. Uh, Mary's got the next question for you. When you are rearing in a vial, do you have to add some kind of moisture? Do you put the whole leaf in? Oh, that's a great question. I put the whole leaf in if I can, if it doesn't squish it too much. And usually that takes a lot to squish them, but you can, so you have to be a little careful. I put it in a in a Ziploc bag if it's if the if the leaf is really big and you don't want to rip the leaf. Sometimes I will rip the leaf if if I if I have to if the but I do put some moisture in there, just a, a few drops of of water on a piece of paper towel and wad that up at the top of the vial, and then click the lid on. Okay. Yeah, so I, I do, you do have to have some moisture in there. If you put them in a Ziploc bag, you have to watch out because it can dry out a little bit, but you can put, you do the same thing. You put a little bit of moisture on a paper towel and, and then just renew it as needed. Yeah. It seems like you'd have to spend a good bit of time familiarizing yourself with the life cycles of so many of these different species, or at least what you think you might have if they crawl out and then pupate on the surface, if they would crawl up onto a stem, if they would drop yeah. down onto the soil and, and pupate yeah. and then trying to, I can yeah. see why it would be difficult to rear these out. It's, it's not that bad in most cases. So okay. it's nice if they, if they pupate in the mines because then you don't have to do any chance to work on that yet, but it's something that I would like to work on in the future. Whenever I'm rich and famous, ha ha. <laughs> all right uh it looks like we lost the stream there for a moment sorry everybody but uh i think we're back i think we're okay oh, did, did i do i need to repeat anything um, or whatever uh let's yeah let's take the question of online field guides or okay. books yeah in okay sure so so charlie eisman has a book um, the, of leaf miners of North America with keys to all the species, but because it covers all of North America and you kind of need to know what plant you have, it, it makes it harder, uh, but you could, but you can still do it. It's probably the best, it's the, be, it's the best reference we've got. It's the only reference we've got and it's a really good one. He's, he's amazing. Um, if we want something simpler, like just for North Carolina, there is none. I'd love to write one and maybe one day I will. Uh, but, uh, and, and so I, I've thought about it many times. So I'd like to do a field guide one day. We'll see. Okay. Uh, you might have some folks here interested in it. All right. Uh, last one, and then we'll call it, how much do leaf miners affect the health of their hose plants? Quick research seems to show the concerns are for food and ornamental plants as far as appearance. Does it depend on the species? It does. It depends on the species. It depends on the year. So, sometimes they're incredibly abundant and only when they're really, because they're so small and the area, and if they're confined to a leaf, then the only damage they can really do as individuals are to one leaf. So that really limits the amount of damage they can do. And usually it's only the part of a leaf. Occasionally it's the whole leaf, but usually it's only part of a leaf. Often the leaves go on living afterwards, but not always. Um, yeah, sometimes it's as the leaf is senescing, as the leaf is going toward death and about to be lost. So 
in that case, it probably doesn't damage things too much. And a lot of leaf miners do that. But, but when it's not, I mean, sure, they can if they're in large numbers. So it can happen. Yeah, food plants definitely. There's, um, what is it, a horse chestnut. There's a leaf miner that was introduced on and that feeds on horse chestnut in the north, northern US. And that one has kind of been a pest and has shown to have some negative effects on the host plant. So it, it, they can, they certainly can. Um, but in many cases, it's probably not going to be easy to measure what that damage is, especially if it's a few miners on a tree. Well, great stuff. I think uh, I think we're all going to be inspired now to go out and look a little bit closer at I the nature so. around us. Yeah, I hope so. Cool. Well, Dr. Tracy Feldman, thanks for being on the Lunchtime Discovery Series today. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciated this opportunity. And viewers, thanks for tuning in as well. We'll see you again next Wednesday at noon for another edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Make sure that you're following the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences on social media and our website to get updates. We're at Natural Sciences on all platforms and naturalsciences.org has the schedule of events and activities and programs just like this one. And of course, you can follow the Office of Environmental Education as well and get updates about what they've got going on at North Carolina EE is their social media handle. And the website for them is eenorthcarolina.org. Great resources all around. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Stay safe. We'll see you again soon. Bye, everyone.